right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we'll be at tonight, and we are going to look at a lot of scripture, but you'll get to stay put right in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You guys excited to be here? Amen. You seem a little quiet tonight. Pastor often asks, would you rather be here than in jail? And I'm not going to ask that question tonight, because Terry always says no. So tonight, I want to ask, how many would rather have Terry in jail tonight than here? <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> he gives it as much as he gets it, so... All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to pick it up in uh, verse, uh, verse number 12. Uh, the Bible says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been, uh, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Verse 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Uh, let's go, to, uh, go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer uh, tonight. Father, we come to you tonight, and uh, Lord, we know and recognize that uh, without you, without the moving of the Holy Spirit of God, uh, Lord, then nothing of eternal value can be accomplished tonight. And so, Lord, we ask for you to do the ministering uh, to each and every heart. We ask that uh, you would just guide and direct uh, each and every person that you would focus their thoughts, focus their, their heart's attention on uh, to your word tonight. God, I pray that you would help me. I pray you'd fill me with your Spirit's power and use me tonight, uh, Lord, to, to be able to communicate the message that you have laid upon my heart. Uh, Lord, I pray that you be honored and glorified. Keep me from saying anything that I, I shouldn't say. Uh, and Lord, help me to be true to your word. Uh, we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I titled it, The Body of Christ, The Message, The Body of Christ. I, I thought about titling it Bodybuilding, but I didn't know how well that would go over. Uh, and so we just kept it, The Body of Christ. Um, the, the concept of, of what the local New Testament church should be uh, is illustrated quite heavily throughout the Bible as a body. It is the way that, that uh, God chose to describe it, uh, and, and we'll see a li in a little bit, uh, a little later, that he chose a few other uh, metaphors to use. Uh, but he very, very heavily likens the church to a body. Uh, I was thinking about it, and even, even 2,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, people understood the body. They, they, they grasp it. We grasp a body because we all have a body. And so we understand it. And so God, God made it and likened it to a body so that we could understand and so that we could glean things from it. Uh, 33 and a half years is, is how long uh, it's believed that the Lord walked on earth. And, and it was over those 33 and a half years that, that Jesus ministered to people. He, he helped people. He healed people. He preached. Uh, uh, he served people. Uh, and he did all of that through his physical body. Today, that work continues on through his spiritual body, through you and I. We have been brought together to perform a task or set a task. We have been uh, uh, brought together. The Bible says that God set us together because he wants to accomplish something through us, through the local New Testament church. Uh, I mentioned that the, the Bible talks quite a bit about uh, the church being a body, uh, I, I put a few, uh, a few different verses on the screen. Uh, Romans 12, 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Ephesians 4, 12 says, uh, for, the, uh, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Uh, Ephesians 1, 23, uh, Colossians 1, 24, Colossians 2, 19. They all talk about the body of Christ. Uh, we use our bodies each and every day to perform tasks. God uses this body to perform his 
work. There is no greater task as a church that we have than to perpetuate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the preeminent thing for the church. Uh, it ought to be preeminent in our own lives, uh, reaching that next soul for Christ. And so uh, everything we do here, we strive to do with that as a goal in mind. Why do we put up these buildings for bus church? So that we can reach the next generation, so that we can reach uh, the next soul. Uh, so tonight I want to talk about the body of Christ and I hope that you'll understand your role in it. I hope you'll understand how you're supposed to treat it and how we are to treat one another. Uh, so point number one tonight is the ministry of the Spirit. Uh, verses uh, 4 through 11, we're going to read quickly, uh, but in your Bibles, verses 4 through 11, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another, uh, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one in the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. It was in John chapter 14 when Jesus began to teach or, or began to state uh, that, that when he would depart from earth, when, when he would uh, be crucified, buried, resurrected, and then ascend back into heaven, it was, it was there in John chapter 14 when he said that he is going to send the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would come in his New Testament ministry uh, he would indwell the believers, and he would empower the believers to carry out the work that he has called uh, the church to do. It is through the Holy Spirit's enabling power that we can accomplish what he has asked us to do. Uh, uh, too often, I think, Christians, uh, they try to, try to serve God, and, and with, maybe with the right motivations, with the right intentions, they, they try to serve God, but they think that they can do it in their own self, in their own strength, in their own power, and and they, they convince themselves, I mean, it's just four- and five-year-olds. It can't be so difficult. It can't be something that, that I've got to rely upon God for. And, and, you know, the truth is, you might be able to week in and week out get through it. You might, might be able to teach a lesson uh, uh, or, or communicate something and teach these kids a Bible verse or something. But, you know, far too often what we see in churches is we see people that are serving in a ministry until they don't. They no longer serve. They, they, for whatever reason, they just got burnt out. Why? Why does that happen? Because they tried to do it in their own self and in their own strength. They, they didn't realize, yeah, my, maybe it's just teaching fours and fives. Maybe you're handed curriculum and all you got to do is, is look it over real quick and put together something fast. You don't think you depend, that you need to depend on the Holy Spirit of God, and they quit. They, they just get burnt out, and they quit, uh, uh, and, and it, there could be reasons, there could be other reasons, that, you know, sin, sin has a way of, of convincing people that they shouldn't be serving in ministry, uh, or, or they shouldn't be doing something. Uh, they, they, they get on a, a downtime, they, they start struggling with things, and they think, well, the right thing to do is for me to pull out of ministry or pull out of, of the area that I'm serving in. Uh, most of the time, that doesn't lead to a good place. Most of the time, when a person pulls out of a, uh, an area that they serve in, it isn't long before we don't see them here anymore. It's happened time and time again. and, and uh, uh, So there could be a number of reasons why people do it, but I think far too often it's because people... They just don't realize how much they need to depend upon the Holy Spirit of God. They just don't realize how important He is to their each and every day. Uh, I believe the Holy Spirit is incredibly important. I believe one of the reasons uh, Jesus told His disciples to stay uh, and not to leave Jerusalem before the Holy Spirit came. He said, before the, the promise of the Father comes, I want you to stay in Jerusalem. And you know, there could be a, a few different reasons why that is, but I believe one of them is, because of how important the Holy Spirit of God was to him. Because how vital he was and how important he was going to be, Acts 1-4, uh, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, 
but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. That promise being uh, him sending the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, in, in that time, he no doubt empowered the apostles, the disciples, to, uh, 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 to perform miracles. They were literally able to do superhuman things. They were healing people. They were casting out demons. Uh, today, that's not how the Holy Spirit of God works in us. None of us are healing anybody. None of us are casting out demons. Um, but there is a role that, that he does provide for us today, that he provides for the local New Testament church. And, and we're going to talk a lot about unity tonight, uh, and that is one of the things, is he provides the miracle of unity. Um, we had a, a house built, uh, last year, and as new houses go, uh, there's problems, and so we had our list of things that we needed our warranty rep to help us with, and, and so after a number of emails that went into the black hole, um, eventually one finally made it, I guess, to the uh, uh, other side, and, and I get a response that says, all right, here's the date, 8 o'clock in the morning, be ready. So I was like, all right, 8 o'clock, I took the day off of work, I stayed home, and and at 8 o'clock, the doorbell rings, and there's this you know, young lady there, and she says, I'm here for drywall repair. I'm like, all right. So I'm walking her through the house, showing her all the areas uh, that she's got to fix things. And so we're in the basement, and the doorbell rings again. It's, I don't know, it's probably like 8.30. And the doorbell rings, and I go upstairs, and there's another guy there. And then as I'm like understanding what this guy's here for, like six other people show up all at the same time. And so now I'm standing at the door, and there's all these people out there all trying to do their job, and one of the guys was the painter. And I looked at the painter, and I said, that lady's doing the drywall repair. What are you going to do? You can't, you can't paint wet drywall. He's like, I'm leaving. I'm like, all right, I get it. You're leaving. I'd leave too if I were you. He didn't want to do half the job. You say, what's the point of this story? The point is... We all have different talents. We all have a different purpose, and we'll see that tonight, but we all have a different role that we play. It takes the Holy Spirit of God orchestrating everything to make it all work. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit of God, uh, we might have the greatest musicians, uh, but nobody's running the nursery. We might have uh, uh, people teaching fours and fives, uh, but we don't have anybody leading songs. It, it takes the Holy Spirit of God to make everybody work together. Without it, you're going to end up with a painter trying to paint wet drywall, uh, and it's just not going to work out. Uh, so he creates, or he provides the miracle of unity, but he also creates a complete picture. Uh, we'll see here in a little bit, uh, he assigns each and every person a specific role. We all have a part to play, uh, and, and I think sadly, uh, most churches, and probably every single church in America today, operates to some extent, to one extent or another, lame. They operate without the full working power that God has provided or that God wants the body to operate in. They, they, there's somebody that has a role, but they decided it's more comfortable to just sit. There's a role that God has placed them in the church for, something that God wants them to accomplish, but it means sacrifice. It means I can't roll into church at 9.05. It means that I have to get here early, that I have to do some sort of preparation the night before. Uh, God gave them a role in the church. God set them in the church for a reason. And too often, uh, uh, people are unwilling to do a role or they're unwilling to get involved, and so the ministry suffers. The body suffers. It doesn't work to the full extent that God designed it to work to. Uh, every single part of the body, you and I, have a purpose in that body. Romans 12, 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let, uh, prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. All of us are different. Okay, prophecy, ministering, giving, all of us are different, each and every one of us, and God has placed us all, all as if we're, we're puzzle pieces and we're forming a single cohesive picture. 
That is the intent that God has for the church. That is the design He has for the church. And it's the Holy Spirit of God and, and His his omniscience, his uh, ability to just orchestrate it all so that it all functions, so that it all works the way that it should work. So the Holy Spirit has a ministry here. Uh, that is why it is so vital that church leadership, that individuals follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God because he is the one that is going to direct and he is the one that's going to make it all work together. Uh, then notice there's the metaphor of the body. Uh, this is a, a bit of a long uh, passage. Uh, we're going to read verses 12 through 21. Um, count how many times the word body is in, in between verses 12 and 21. Uh, I think I know how to count, but I struggled once I ran out of fingers. So uh, keep track and see how important it is that it, God said it so many times in this passage. He wants us to get it. He wants us to understand it. So, uh, verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot, sh if the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not uh, the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the he hearing? If the whole uh, were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God hath set, uh, but now hath God set the members of every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members yet, but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Uh, I counted 13 times. Uh, again, I struggle when I run out of fingers, but I think I got 13 times the Bible in that, in that uh, nine verses used the word body. It uses uh, uh, the metaphor of the body, and, and, and I thought it would be good as a, a little bit of a Bible study here tonight that uh, we would take a look at the other metaphors that God uses in his word to define or to describe what is the church. Uh, the body being the most prominent one, the one that the Bible uses the most, but he also uses uh, a handful of others. And, and I think when you look at the other ways that God describes the church, it enlightens us and it helps us understand different aspects of the church, different ways uh, we're, we're supposed to uh, be part of the church or or, or different attitudes we should have. Uh, and so I wanted to look at, at the other ways that God defines or describes the church, other metaphors he uses. Uh, the first one he uses is the flock. Acts chapter 20, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. As I thought about this uh, metaphor, I thought about a flock. Okay, a flock of sheep. Uh, not a good idea if the sheep run the show. There's submission that must take place. God has placed an authority in the church, and it is the sheep's responsibility to submit to that authority. We don't like that. As mankind, we, we, uh, 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 we, we just, ah, to that authority. We, we struggle with submitting to authority, and yet, and yet God has placed authority over us. And it is our job as sheep to submit to that authority. Uh, a, a shepherd has the responsibility of protecting the sheep. I, uh, I like to hunt. I enjoy hunting. Um, I can guarantee you something. Uh, when I go hunting, I know where the elk are. I guarantee you I know where they are. They're on the private property right outside of where I'm allowed to hunt. I guarantee you they are there. Neil, am I right? They know where to find private property. You say, what's the point? The point is, you know who the, sheep, uh, the, the elk, the ones that get harvested are? The ones that become prey? It's the ones that leave the protection of the herd. It's the ones that, that decided they'd just go out and try it out for a little bit, so they wandered off. 
the sheep that leave the protection of the church. They're the ones that become prey. God has placed the church, and, and one of the roles of the church is to provide protection for the sheep. But too many people think they don't need the church, that they, they can do it without the church, and when they do, they become the prey. They become the ones that separate from the safety of the herd, from the protection of the shepherd, and they become prey and become uh, 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 the, the, the ones that get uh, plucked out and the ones that Satan attacks. Uh, they're the ones that struggle. So a flock. A flock also needs to be fed. That's what pastor does for us. When he's preaching, when, when he, he goes through the effort of, uh, of, of uh, revival meetings or a men's retreat or, or the spiritual uh, help conference, all of those things are designed to feed the sheep to grow the sheep, to, to build up the sheep and to strengthen the sheep. That's what they're for. And so we see that as the Bible describes the flock, we, we can understand that is something that the, 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 the church is supposed to do. It is supposed to feed the pastor, the, the shepherd should feed the, the sheep. The Bible also uses a building in Ephesians 2.21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Uh, what does this help us understand? Uh, this helps us understand that there's many different parts. There's many different pieces. If we were to attempt to erect this building out there with uh, just nails, we wouldn't have much to show for it, would we? It takes differences. It takes diversity of people. It takes different talents and different gifts that the Holy Spirit of God has given to each and every person. Uh, and I'm going to harp on it tonight, which is why it is so important that we all do our part. God made you a specific part and he set you in this church for a specific reason. It is very important. Uh, in order to build that building, we must have the diversity. We must have everyone involved. Uh, the Bible also calls the church the house of God. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house a ho and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3.15 But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, I don't know about you. I'm a homebody. If I could, if I could just stay at home and never have to go to work, man, I would be the happiest guy alive. I just like being at home. I like the comfort of home. Uh, I like the rest that I get at home. Uh, I like that it's my home. No one can kick me out of it. Uh, I just like being at home. This metaphor helps us understand the church should be where God dwells. It should be where the Holy Spirit of God dwells. Ephesians 2.22 in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Uh, he should feel invited here. He should feel welcomed. He should feel honored. He should be the guest of honor in the church. Uh, you say, doesn't God just indwell the church? Not everything that calls itself a church is a place that God inhabits. Uh, there's a lot of churches over the years that, that once stood for the faith, that once uh, uh, held standards and held convictions and, and, and believed that it was the Lord's church and it should be His the way He wants it to be. And, and a lot of those churches have, have compromised and, and they've, uh, uh, they've gone their own way for, for whatever the reasons are. The, the pastor, the leadership convinces themselves uh, that they need to do something different uh, you say, well, are they dead? A lot of people go. A lot of people will be found in churches like that that have abandoned the Bible, that have abandoned the, the, uh, uh, the faith that uh, the Bible says we're to hold to the traditions of our fathers. They've, they've abandoned all of those things. They've compromised, yet they'll be packed with people. And yet God doesn't dwell there. Uh, so not every, everything that calls itself a church is a place that God inhabits. Not everything that seems like God is working in it is really a place that God inhabits. 
Uh, we are 323 light years away from the North Star. If we traveled at the rate of which our, our current space travel could get us, it would take us 100,000 years to get to the North Star. 323 light years away. Do you know what that means? You could go out if it was clear uh, and, and get a telescope or even with the naked eye see the North Star. You say, well, the North Star's still there. No. None of us actually know whether or not the North Star is actually still emitting light today. That light could still just be traveling here, 323 light years. It could have burnt out while Jesus was walking on the earth, and there's still just a ray of light coming through it. What's your point? My point is, just because it looks like things are happening doesn't mean it's the place God inhabits. Doesn't mean it's a place that, that uh, God dwells. Uh, we, we ought to be very careful, and, and you all are here, and you should be here, okay? But we ought to be careful when, when people go and, and they think, well, this church just seems like the happening place to be. Just because it seems like that doesn't mean that it's a place that God inhabits, that he dwells. Uh, the North Star could have been burned out thousands of years ago. What does that help us understand? Uh, we've had a number of people saved here as of late, uh, 20, 30 people or something in the last uh, couple of months. That means we can't slow down. That means we can't compromise. Uh, this is the Lord's church, and we have to keep it the Lord's church. We have to let him have church the way he wants church. Uh, it is his church. Uh, he knows what he's doing with it. pastor says it all the time. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's not up to us to try to figure out the next uh, best thing to do. We follow the Holy Spirit of God, and we follow his leading. Uh, God will inhabit, uh, as Psalm 22, 3 says, God will inhabit the praise of Israel. He inhabits the praise of his people. So we want God to feel welcomed here, then this ought to be a place where we worship him. Well, I sang the songs. Did you worship? Did it come from your heart, or did you just read words off a screen? We ought to thank God for what he does. We ought to be going around bragging on God to people. We ought to be inviting him to be here. He inhabits the praise of his people. Uh, lastly, the Bible likens the church to the bride of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, uh, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a, as a chaste virgin to Christ. Revelation 19, 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Uh, this metaphor shows us that there is a relationship. Uh, in order for there to be a marriage, there must be two consenting parties. It takes two people to agree together uh, to have a marriage. Uh, the verse on the back wall there, uh, John 3:16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him. God said he's willing, but it takes the individual to also be willing. It is a relationship. Uh, we must, uh, both parties must agree to it. Uh, God will not force anybody into the relationship, and he will not reject anyone who wants to be part of that relationship. He will not prevent anyone from being saved. Uh, it is our choice. It is a relationship. Uh, so there's several different metaphors, but again, the one that is most often used is the body. And the text of 1 Corinthians 12, as it's described uh, here, uses the body, and it helps us understand several things. Uh, there, there's a, a handful of points here. We're going to go through them relatively quickly. Um, so try to keep up. First, we are many, and yet we are one body. Uh, verse 12, uh, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body. Verse 14, For the body is not one member, but many. The body's one, but, the, but hath many members. Uh, this is again, uh, if, if, if you're keeping track, this is the second time in the passage that we're going through here tonight. It is the second time that God calls for unity in the church. It's a big deal to him, and, it's not the, and he's not done here. He's going to call for it yet again. There ought to be unity in the church. There ought to be complete unity 
in the church. Jesus concerned himself with this. In John chapter 17, verse 20 through 22, he prayed this. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they, may all, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Our unity, uh, whether or not people will believe that God sent Jesus, depends upon our unity. Uh, verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Uh, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, right? If ye have love one for another. Uh, friend, tonight I ask you, who are you at odds with? Who, who is it that you would be okay if they walked out these doors and never came back? Can't have unity if you're okay with somebody leaving the church. Can't have unity if you're at odds with somebody. Uh, who is it that you're unwilling to sacrifice for? We must have unity. We will never accomplish what God has set us out to do if we, aren't, if we aren't in complete unity with one another. If there's someone you're at odds with, if there's someone that it wouldn't bother you if they never came back to this church, if there's someone that, not that one, I won't sacrifice for them, then friend, you are not in unity with the church. Next, we make a mistake when we compare ourselves within the body. Uh, verses 15 to 16, if the foot... Sh if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? I told you we'd be reading a lot of scripture. Uh, four times in verses 8 and 9, four times in verses 8 and 9, uh, the Bible says that the gifts that are given are given by the Spirit. It is given by the Spirit. Uh, in verses 15 and 16, we're shown that there needs to be different gifts. That, that it is uh, uh, necessary for there to be a diversity of gifts. Uh, if, if you're not the hand, why are you comparing yourself to the one that is? Why are you, well, I don't have that talent. I can't be used. I, I can't sing in the choir. I, I can't teach fours and five. I don't have that talent. Why are you down about it? God didn't ask you to be the hand. He might have asked you to be the eye. Why is it that so many Christians, they look at the things that they can't do and then they just don't do? Oh, I can't do that, so I won't do anything. Instead of understanding and seeking the Lord, what is my gift? How did you gift me? What, what is it that I have that you have given to me? What role did you give to me in this church? Too many Christians, they, well, I'm not as good as this one and they discourage themselves, and they convince themselves because they don't have a talent that somebody else has that they become unnecessary or, or unneeded in the church. Uh, let's not get discouraged because someone has a talent we don't have. There's a lot of talents I don't have. A lot of them. And you can tell. <laughs> There's a lot of talents that each of us don't have. God gave to each one of us a different talent. If you're, if you're the hand, you're part of the body. You're a necessary part of the body. If you're the foot, guess what? You're a part of the body and a necessary part of the body. If you're the eye, if you're the ear, if you're the nose, the tongue, you are a part of the body and you are a necessary part of the body. We are all something, and because we are all something, we all have something to do. So what is it that is your part, friend? And how are you performing it? Say, well, I don't know what I am. God, God hasn't given me a role in this church. Uh, you've not gone and asked God for the role in the church. You don't want a role in the church. It's not that God hasn't given you a role in this church. When He set you in this church, the Bible says He set you for His pleasure. He set you here with a purpose. So you have a purpose here. You say, well, I don't know what it is. Well, then you seek God and find out. Figure it out. Make yourself available. Uh, we, we, we uh, as, as ministry leaders, different ministry leaders, I can promise you, 
there's room. There are people that we need every Sunday morning. Do you see the ushers that we line up up here? Those are the best we got. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> we need some better looking ushers, amen? All the ushers quit. Sorry, Tom. Um, listen, there's a role for you. There is a place for you. Let's not waste the gift God's given to us. Let's not begrudge God over what gift he has given to us. Well, I wish I had the gift of singing, but I don't. Okay, why are you going to begrudge God? We do well to, to trust God when God says, that one's the hand, that one's the foot. We do well to trust him and his planning. Instead of begrudging him, instead of uh, discouraging ourselves, instead of uh, 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 comparing to somebody else, we would do good to just trust God. All right, God, that's my role. Praise God I can serve you. Thank God I have a role. Thank God there's something that I can do in the house of God, in the church. Worse than discouraging yourself uh, over what you don't have is comparing yourself to somebody else and thinking you're better than them. So does that actually happen? All the time. How many people are unwilling to clean toilets? Praise God they get, they get cleaned, amen? Praise God the toilets get cleaned. Well, I, I, I would never, that's, oh, I would never clean the toilet. So you're better than the one that does? Somebody's doing it, and if you're unwilling to do it because you're too good for it, well, that means you're better than the one that is doing it. Only thing worse than saying we're discourage, getting discouraged over what we don't have, is a talent we don't have, is saying we're better than somebody else. We're going to see here shortly uh, that we are all necessary uh, in the house of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. God says it's a pretty foolish thing to do when we compare ourselves one to another. Uh, let's, let's not compare ourselves and let's rejoice in the role that God has given to us. Uh, next, we are made purposefully unique for the body. Uh, we are not the same people. We have all sorts of different gifts and talents and personalities. Uh, verses 17 through 20, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. Uh, I don't know about you. I'm not real big on spending money. I, I, I'm a bit of a tightwad in, the, in that regard. Not as much as I used to be. But um, I don't like spending money. And I really don't like spending a whole lot of money on shoes. Can you imagine how much a, a set of shoes would be if you had 10 feet? It's like $75 for two of them. If you had 10 of them, you'd go bankrupt. You'd need to mortgage your house just to get a new set of shoes. God knows what he's doing when he put the church together. He understands it. He, he, we see the individual puzzle pieces that we are and maybe that a couple other people are. God sees the whole picture. God knows what he's doing when he's placing people into the church. He knows what he's doing when he's giving a gift to this one or to that one. He's got it down. We don't see the big picture. We all think that, well, this would be the best thing if we all did this. And if we all were the same way, this church would not function. It'd function as well as somebody with 10 feet. Man, would that be hard to walk. Uh, God knows what he's doing. Let's trust him. Uh, and let's uh, submit ourselves to what it is that he has called us to do or what he has asked us to do uh, in the church. Uh, verse 18 makes something very clear to us. Uh, I'm going to find, I'm going to read it again. Uh, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in, in the body. I've, I've quoted that uh, a few times. I've said that God has set them in. That is the verse that tells us God places the individual people in the church. Uh, he knows what he's doing when he's bringing people here. And this is what makes it so dangerous when people think, well, I got offended. I didn't like when he preached on tithing. I didn't like uh, what the, the pastor said or, or somebody from across the auditorium looked at me 
cross-eyed and, and now I'm offended and I'm mad and I'm going to leave the church. Really? Did God unset you? Did God unset you from one body and set you into another? The people that do that, the people that get offended and leave like that, number one, they're not dealing with... with uh, they're, they're, they've got a spirit of unforgiveness. They, uh, they're they're going to deal with bitterness. Uh, but not only do they harm themselves when they do that, they take themselves out of the church that God placed them in, but they harm the body. The body needs two feet to function right. The body needs two hands to function right. And when people think that, well... We're just going to go try something else. They do it to their own peril, and they do it uh, hurting the body of Christ. Next, we are meant for one another within the body. Uh, this one's important. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Listen, we need each other. As a body of Christ, we need each other. In order for the body to reach its potential, we all have to work together. We, we all must be doing our part. We all must be uh, pulling on the rope. Uh, this, uh, there isn't a single person in this church that you do not need. You ever think about it that way? Any particular body part of yours you just want to give up? Nope. We need one another. We need each and every one of us. And it would be good if this church treated people like we needed each other. The gossiping would stop. The backbiting would stop. The, the critical spirit would stop. The, 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 the cliques would all be disbanded. If we genuinely acknowledged our need for one another all of that would cease. When you genuinely acknowledge you need something, I, as I was preparing this, I thought of Brian. I don't, I don't see him here tonight. Uh, but if you talk to Brian about the night that it was a ruptured aorta, right? The night his aorta ruptured, uh, he will, from his own mouth, tell you how absolutely important God was involved in all of that. Where they went to dinner that night mattered. They weren't going to go there. They were going to go somewhere else, and, and, and he got convinced to go where, he, where they went to dinner, uh, and that put them in a certain place to go to a certain hospital. And then that hospital uh, had the right staff on and, and ultimately gets all the way down to the right surgeon. Brian needed that surgeon to live. How many critical words do you think he'd have for that surgeon? He, he, he would tell you, he didn't have a single critical thing to say about him. Why? Because he knew he needed him. Wasn't judging somebody else. Wasn't gossiping uh, uh, against other people. Wasn't putting people down or slandering people. All of that would cease if we acknowledged how much we need each other. It'd all be done. Galatians 6, 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's a lot easier to do when you recognize we need each other. Every one of us needs every one of us. Uh, lastly tonight, the members of the church. Uh, yeah, Let's read verses 22 to 31. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Uh, yep, the feeble are necessary, is what it says. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. All Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? 
Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I you unto you a more excellent way. Membership in 2022 casts a pretty wide net. I'm an Amazon Prime member. And yet, that doesn't carry the same weight as a member of a local body of Christ. Uh, uh, the, the relationship that my membership here at this church carries is so much more significant. It is where I uh, become into a relationship with each of you. It is, it is where I serve the Lord. It is uh, where I am spiritually connected to uh, my Lord. Uh, it, is, it is a thing that has been cast aside in a lot of churches today, uh, but it is a very important part of the church. Let's look at a few things, and then I'll be done. There's a myth about members. There's a myth about the members. Uh, verse 22 silences critics. You say, well, you've already said um, that each one is, is important, and then and that everybody's necessary. Uh, I have, uh, but so often people think they're not necessary. Well, what can I do? I'm too old. I'm too young. Uh, I, I'm, I'm too uh, uh, physically unable to do something. May I remind you, verse 18 said, God set you in the church for His pleasure. There is a reason God set you in the church. There isn't a single person that God doesn't have a desire and an expectation that they do something in the church. Not a single one. Well, it's not the, the, the most prominent position. It's, it's, it, it seems like it's trivial what I do here. You know, if, if, if you were in a car accident and the result of the airbag, you have a broken nose, um, and just the impact and everything, uh, both of your lungs are collapsed. Time's critical. You want the doctor to work on the nose first? Well, that's the prominent one. It's the one that so often we think is the valuable one. Well, prominence doesn't mean importance. Uh, 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 somebody that preaches or uh, uh, Pastor Knutson leading the choir or whatever it might be, they're no more important than the ones that are changing diapers in the nursery. They're no more important than the ones that are cleaning the toilets. Just because they're prominent doesn't mean they're more important. So you, you can't let yourself think that you're not necessary. God put you here. You have a reason you're here. You are necessary. Uh, you know, sometimes when, when it's the, the mighty things, the, the prominence, uh, too often that member is the one that gets the credit. When, when the, the strong man lifts something heavy, everybody says, well, we expected that. But you know, when the weak does something that, that is amazing, who gets the credit then? Man can't take credit for the things that God does. Uh, so, so often, it is, it is the ones that are weak that God gets the most glory from. Uh, next, there's a ministry among the members. Uh, verse 25 says there's no schism in the body. Uh, verse 26 uh, says uh, when one member suffer, all the members suffer. Uh, when one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Uh, if you're counting, this is the third time he calls for unity. This is the third time in this passage he calls for unity. Do you hurt when others hurt? Do you rejoice when others rejoice? We're about to have a, a baby, a new baby into the nursery. Are you going to rejoice? We've gone through some tough trials these last couple months. Did you weep with them that weeped, that wept? Are, are you affected by what's going on in another person's life? If we have genuine unity, other circumstances will uh, impact us. Uh, there's a master above all. Uh, verse 27 says, we are the body of Christ. We ought not forget that. We ought not think that we're a body of Elmwood Baptist Church. We're not a body of Pastor Gary Randall. We are a body of Christ. He is the head of the church, and, and for the sake of time, I won't read those verses, but he is the head of the church. He is the director of the church. 
Everything we do at this church, we do because God directs us to do it. We strive for that anyways, not to say we're perfect, but we strive for that. Uh, and then uh, there is a mission available to all members. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, you all have uh, gone to a, a restaurant lately, but we were, we were at Chili's uh, a few weeks ago now, and I think we waited for like an hour or something. We waited for a long time, but we get in there, and there's like 50 empty tables. What in the world? Well, they don't have the staff. These restaurants are understaffed. And it's really inconvenient, isn't it? It's really frustrating when you wait for an hour just to get seated to get some food. Uh, these restaurants, they're understaffed. Can I tell you, for 2,000 years, the church has been understaffed. For 2,000 years... Uh, the church has, has had open positions that no one's filling. It's frustrating when you've got to wait for your food for an hour. You can see and you can acknowledge how bad and how big of an impact that is, but yet the church operates the same way and too many people, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't fill out the resume and say, I'm willing to help. They don't go seek a, a ministry leader and say, hey, where can I help? Listen, all we're going to do is ask you to pray about something, and then we'll let God direct. That is, that is the way Pastor uh, uh, has told his ministry leaders to do it. I think that is the way the Bible would tell us to do it. Hey, would you pray about this? But listen, uh, very rarely will somebody just come to you. You've got to make yourself available. Uh, when we don't, the church suffers. When, when people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, when, when people are, honestly, when people are doing just what they think they should be doing, and it's not what God directed them to do, that ministry suffers still. So we need to make sure what we do, we do for the right reasons, that, that we're doing what God wants us to do. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll close in prayer here this, uh, this evening. Uh, Father, I, I pray that... Uh, Lord, this uh, message uh, 